room is full. It's packed. Absolutely <laughs> packed. Standing room only. We'll do what we can. So good morning. Welcome to this conversation with the residents of Concord Park where the Wonderland Puppet Theater began in 1961. I am Paulette Richards, curator of the wonderful Wonderland Puppet Theater exhibit here at the Puppeteers of America 2023 National Festival, and also author of the book Object Performance in the Black Atlantic, which features a chapter on American puppet modernism detailing the Wonderland Puppet Theater. Um, what we're gonna do is spend about 35 minutes at this point talking about Concord Park, hopefully 40 minutes talking about the Wonderland Puppet Theater, and then open conversation for the rest of the session. I don't have bios from each of our panelists, so we're just gonna go down the line and if you could say your elevator speech about who you are, where you come from. Thank you. To my right, please. Good morning, everyone. My name is Joyce Hadley. I am retired, uh, Verizon uh, Communications, and I am currently still living in Concord Park, Trevos, Bucks County, Pennsylvania. I'm very happy to report that I am still there, and there are just maybe a handful of original Concord Park residents who still remain, but uh, Bucks County and Trevos is still a wonderful, wonderful area to live in. Um, in my retirement, I am involved in many organizations. I volunteer for many organizations, and so that keeps me quite busy. But I'm very happy to be here today with my colleagues and friends I've known all my life to tell you more about my Concord Park experience, and they as well will tell you about theirs. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Elevator pitch is 25 words or less. Uh oh. <laughs> uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Look out. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jennifer Swan. I'm the oldest of the five Swan children, and I grew up in Concord Park. We moved there when I was three years old. Joyce was our babysitter for several years. I know I'm beyond the 25 words. <laughs> and um, we were, I currently am a professor at Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and I am a professor of neuroscience, and I am also there, one of their three ombuds. I'm Jeff Swan. I'm the oldest son and obviously the best looking of the swans. <laughs> and uh, I, was, uh, I was the first child born into Concord Park and we moved out of Concord Park when I turned 13. So my childhood for all intents and purposes was in Concord Park. I am a uh, almost retired owner of several computer companies and cannot wait to be fully retired. There you go. Jay? I am Jay Swan, the youngest of five, as you can tell. Um, I grew up in Warminster. When I was two, I moved out of Concord Park. I grew up in Warminster, um, and um, that's about it. Thank you for keeping the time. <laughs> <laughs> the only one who got to 25 There months. you go. <laughs> I'm Lauren Swan. I am the third child and second daughter of Alice Swan, and I thought I was the first baby born in the Conquer Park, but who, who knows, we'll have to check the records on that. I happen to be a nutritionist by profession, and one of my specialties is cultural foodways, and I got another connection here with, um, that with uh, my, I did a cookbook that uh, Faith Ringgold did the cover art for, so that was another connection with Paulette. So uh, very happy to be here today. Good, good morning. I'm Mark Schmally, um, the only son of Nancy Schmally, Alice's uh, puppetry partner. And I ran a whitewater rafting company for about 35 years and uh, currently reside in the beautiful Adirondack Mountains in upstate New York and plan on residing there forever. Thank you. Yeah, I grew up in Concord Park. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, panelists. I'm gonna give a very quick rundown on what was Concord Park, and then we'll get into our questions. So, Morris Milgram was the son of an impoverished Jewish immigrant family who worked in the garment district in New York City. 
By the time he was 18, he had become the equivalent of a woke radical and was expelled from City College for leading a protest against a reception for a visiting delegation of Italian fascist students in 1934. Milgram completed his education at Dana College and then took a job with the Workers' Defense League. William Snello, his father-in-law, repeatedly invited him to join his construction business. Finally, in 1947, Milgram agreed, but with the goal of building open occupancy housing. After Snello passed away, Milgram partnered with George Otto. They raised $150,000 in venture capital by challenging their socialist and Quaker networks to put your money where your heart is. Having so secured the financing, they acquired a property in Trevose, Pennsylvania, with plans to develop a subdivision of single-family homes for middle-class buyers. The development Milgram launched with the money was Concord Park. So my first question, and I'm going to start on the end with uh, Marco Schmali, is how did your family get to Concord Park? Um, well, uh, my parents both grew up in Pittsburgh. My father, uh, very poor. Um, and so he lived in a diverse um, neighborhood in Pittsburgh. And they, um, they went to college. My dad went to med school. And then they went to India as missionaries for a church. And in 1954, um, they went to India in 51, I believe. 54, my sister Becky was born. And they decided to come back to... Um, to the states, so they took a eight-month freighter ride from India back. Um, they arrived back in Pittsburgh, and um, sadly, the church that they were doing the missionary work for said, well, we didn't think you were gonna come back, so go back to India. And my parents didn't like that welcome, and so they uh, kind of just pulled up from Pittsburgh and moved to Philadelphia to Friends Hospital where my dad took a residency in psychiatry and it was there that I was born and they were looking for a place in the suburbs um, and Concord Park just kind of checked the boxes of the right place um, and the diversity and the intentional integration um, was not a major factor, but it was certainly not a stumbling block. They just saw it as a wonderful place to uh, raise their now family of two children. And so that's how we ended up there. And I, I think we moved in, um, let's see, I was born in 57, so we probably moved in in 59, um, I think. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, thank you. Now yep. I'll pass that also to Joyce. My parents, Marjorie and George Hadley, were living in Philadelphia at the time, uh, in North Philadelphia on a street called Bouvier Street, which was a pretty little tree-lined street, row homes. And one day, my father worked for the Veterans Administration, and one of his friends told him about an ad that they had seen in a newspaper about this place called Concord Park in Trevos, which was an intentionally planned, integrated community. So my father told my mother, and they decided to take this venture because in those days there was no I-95. There was only Route 1, which was the Roosevelt Boulevard, which was a three a, a, a section, three on one side and three on the other side of roadway. And uh, it took about 40 minutes, so it was like going through the country back in those days. So my parents took the trip out to uh, see the Concord Park homes where they met uh, Morris and um, some of the people who were the sales representatives. And they thought that this is an ideal place to raise me. Because at the time, my sister and brother, I, I have siblings, one of whom is deceased now, but my, sibling, my siblings were Marguerite and Henry. And uh, they, so at the time, it was just myself. So they thought that this would be an ideal place to raise children and get out of the city, because the city, for, they, for their purposes, didn't have much to offer for a young family. So that's how I came about coming to Concord Park. I was seven or eight years old when I came there. And I'll never forget looking at the houses being built and the wonders of a child having your own bedroom. And my, I never forget my father said, well, what color do you want your bedroom to be? And I said, pink. And in those days, they used this spray, spray paint that had all these speckles in it. 
and it was just marvelous. I had this pink bedroom with these speckles. <laughs> and uh, so, and, and it was when I still to this day remember the smell of the two by fours as they were building the house because every so often my parents would come out to see exactly what was going on with the construction of the house and it was a very exciting thing plus meeting new friends along the way. So that's how, and this was, by the way, my parents moved in January of 1956. And Warren Schwartzbeck, who was also a community member there, sold the home to them. And to this day, we are still friends with his daughter, Karen Schwartzbeck. So it was just an ideal situation. Okay, thank you. I'm going to delegate Jennifer Swan. I have no idea, so I'm gonna to go to Jeffrey. <laughs> The, as I understand the story, um, my mother and my father, my father was a World War II vet. He had come back and under the uh, GI Bill had gone to Howard where at a dance he met my mother. There's some argument about how actually that happened, but we'll just go with that story. They uh, got married and my mom in a statement said, that they did not believe that my father, who was now an architect, was going to get any opportunity in Washington, D.C. as a black architect to do any work. So they were going to move to Boston. They were on their way to Boston and over, ran into an ad in the paper that offered a job that my father applied for and got. So that's where they stopped. So they stopped in Philadelphia. Um, then they had Jennifer and they realized that that was kind of an error. So, no, I mean, uh, <laughs> they really, <laughs> anyway, so they had Jennifer, so they were living in the apartment. I believe my mom got a job at the time. My mom was a teacher by, by profession, and uh, her mother, uh, Nanny, to us, moved up to Philadelphia. I'm not sure how that worked. Nanny, my mom, my dad, and Jennifer in a one-bedroom apartment, so I'm sure that that was a pleasantly unpleasant time. Then my mother became pregnant with me and she realized that, uh, or they came to the conclusion that perhaps this was not the best idea. I don't know how they found Concord Park, I cannot speak to that, but I know that they had decided that that was when they needed to move and they could afford the mortgage, which I believe was $90 a month. I think that was the mortgage bill. Uh, and they moved to Concord Park. So. I'm pretty certain, I don't know the exact time, but I'm pretty certain it was the spring of 57 that they moved to Concord Park. Okay, thank you. So the next question, unlike today when parents often feel it is not safe to let their children play outdoors unsupervised, Concord Park was like a village where children could roam with a wide degree of freedom and even be fed in any house. What are your memories of playing in the neighbor's yards and eating in neighbor's homes? Oh, sure. Um, a lot of fun. <laughs> you know, one of the things when I think back on my experiences in Concord Park is I felt really safe. I didn't have any fears at all. On the block with the houses, all those neighbors were family. We were like one big extended family. We lived, it takes a village, before it became a coined phrase. And part of that was also the 1950s and 60s, we had more community neighborhoods than what happened later in the 80s and 90s. Um, but we just had lots of fun. We, we didn't really have a lot of worries. You know, we, your friends were all up and down the block. Their parents welcomed you into their homes. There were community activities going on all the time. So I have very good memories of Concord Park. I sometimes feel like I was one of the luckiest kids in the world to grow up there. We had a community babysitting. We had a community kindergarten uh, that my mom started that we, we all went to. And we had, the neighbors were so united that if you were playing at someone else's house and it got dark, one person, the parent would call the parent of that house and say, can you get those kids and send them back home because it's time. Like you could not do anything without having the network react to what you were doing. And so it was really, really a community. You could not get away with very much. One time I was fighting with somebody and before I could get home, my mom knew about it. So when I got home, she was like, I heard what happened. And I was just walking down the block. It was on the same block. I'm walking down the block and she's like, get in here, you know, so I'm like, how did you, because the mom of that kid had already called her before we even got down the street. And this was before cell phones, this was land, landlines, 
Um, so that's how connected they were. And it was, it was really a nice, I'll say one more story. There, we had a dog named Miracle and he would lay in the middle of the intersection of the roads that ran by our house. He would just lie in the middle and people would stop and they'd come over, can you get your dog out of the middle of the street? <laughs> because he's right in the middle of the street. <laughs> so yes. The sense of community was for real. You could walk at any time of the day, walk up and down the street and just say, oh, they're having lunch right now. You just walk into the house and sit down and have lunch. No invitation, you know. You would just, every child felt free to go wherever they wanted to go. There was no sense of fear about anyone. And this is the thing about, we knew about DEI way back then because there were many different cultures who, that were living in Concord Park at the time. Also, the sense of community was wonderful during the Christmas season because we would all go Christmas caroling up and down the street and sing in front of this neighbor's house, that neighbor's house, and quite often the neighbor would come out and give us hot chocolate or some marshmallows to go in the hot chocolate. It was just wonderful. There was an artist by the name of Henry Bozeman Jones who used to put a beautiful canvas on his garage door. Sometime it was the Magi, sometime it was Santa Claus, and we loved to go to his house because his wife would always give us some nice little treats when we sang at his house. So the sense of community was always there. In the summer, there were community picnics where each household would bring a special dish down to the playground. And I'd like for someone to speak about the playground because I think, was it your dad that designed it? Yes, yes. I, I, the Conquer Park, if you looked at it, was sort of, I want to say one other thing about Conquer Park. It was like living in a bubble. Mm -hmm. It wrapped around, the way the roads wrapped around, we were butted up against a highway and a highway, and then behind us was a drive-in, a movie theater. So you were kind of like enclosed in an area. And as a result of that, you grew up in a unique bubble because there were issues if you went outside of the bubble. Mm -hmm. It was truly a bubble. Um, but there was a piece of land at the very end and they decided they were gonna put up a playground. So my father being an architect, and there were several engineers in the community, uh, got together and they designed the playground and then the community built it as I understand it. The, it. No one was brought in from the outside. They laid the concrete and the foundation, they put up the things, and we all went and uh, played there. It was, it was very, very, it was truly uh, a unique experience. I think that's a fair statement. Yeah, I would like to add to, my father told me the reason that my parents moved to Concord Park, that was a place he could find in the suburbs that accepted blacks. That was it. And uh, we, it, it was sort of a bubble, but it's important to also point out, it was intentionally put right next to Lincolnia. Lincolnia was the first all black neighborhood in the suburbs. And the two were not connected in terms of their origin, but Milgram intentionally put Concord Park next to Lincolnia to give the black residents, you know, a, a sense of of belonging and that sort of thing. And I remember, that's something else I remember as a child, I felt so lucky. I'm like, there's an all black neighborhood here. I'm in the mixed one. And then there's this outer world that even though we were in this Concord Park bubble, we knew that there was racism out there. So we did enjoy our experience, but we were aware that, you know, the, the world out there wasn't exactly the same. And I just want to add that the reason that it was so communal was because of the Quakers. Yes. So when Milgram did this, he opened it up to whites and blacks. The blacks bought in because it was a place where they could come and get housing that they could afford, which was not really prevalent in, at least in Philadelphia, and I know about the rest of the world. And they, then he said, because he was getting more blacks than whites, he said, okay, well, then I have to sell to whites before. And the Quakers who lived in Bringuelet, which is very near Concord Park, were the other group who then bought in. And so that, that's how they balanced out the, the neighborhood. Quakers have an amazing sense of community. And I, I feel that those were, that was the reason that we had the communal approach that we did. And it was extremely communal. And so I credit the Quakers for that. Yeah. Yes, and to that point about the Quakers, directly across the street from my home, the Quakers bought the home uh, house for a German family who had escaped from Berlin at the time. 
and uh, the father was in the German Navy, and he told, he used to come over to our house all the time, and he and my father would exchange stories about his being in the German Navy and my father talking about the uh, being an African-American in the segregated army. And the two of them would share some very important um, stories all the time. But also, I just want to get back to the playground for just one second, because not only did we have picnics there, but also in the winter, the men would flood the playground, and we would go down there and ice skate. And that's how many of us learned how to ice skate. It was just wonderful. And also, other community activities, Fourth of July was a big to-do in Concord Park, because we would, you know, we were very patriotic. And we had uh, crepe paper, and we would uh, decorate our bicycles and ride all around, up and down all the circles of Concord Park. By the way, 135 homes were the total, that was the total amount of homes that Morris Milgram built. At the end of the bicycle parade at July 4th, one of the parents, or two of the parents, would be the judge, and they would select the, the bike that was most wonderful and so forth and so on, and then the ch child would get a little prize. So we just had lots of love, I should say, mm -hmm. lots of love from all the parents in the community. Um, yeah, I just uh, wrote down quickly my first, the first words that came to my head when I thought of, of Concord Park. So, no fences, 4th of July, many moms, <laughs> freedom, um, intact families, playgroup, boats. There were a lot of boats for being a long way away from water, water. but there were boats. <laughs> Mosquito trucks. Yeah. Gloria Lawrence singing. Tricycles and then bicycles. Hiding in the hamper. I don't know if you guys yeah. hear a hamper. Yeah. I hid in that hamper all the time. Yeah. 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 That was the first place my mom looked when she was she couldn't find me. Yeah. Yeah. Diversity. Highway pool and St. Francis for swimming. Yes. Fun. Tree climbing yes. on the smaller tree. There weren't a lot of trees in Concord Park, but we climbed, I think, every one of them. Yeah. Um, and just life of plenty. Um, it felt like, as a child, I had everything that I could have wanted. Um, and that included food which we uh, did, I did enjoy, I don't know if I was one of the better ones at finding my way into other people's kitchen <laughs> and uh, at, at lunchtime or dinner time and finding snacks, but I, um, according to my mom, I had a reputation for um, finding food in other people's houses, um, so. Um, which was strange because Mark's house was the only house that was serving anything good. <laughs> I don't know why he came down to our house. We had peanut butter and jelly. His, his mom was putting out ham and cheese. We're like, what the, what are you doing down here? <laughs> must, have been, must have been change of pace. Must have been change of pace. And I can assure you the fathers might perceive that differently because I heard different things from my father about what your father said about meals. So <laughs> there could be some different perceptions going on there. And when it comes to food, I think it somehow sparked my interest in cultural food ways because we would have potlucks where the table would be laid out and they would put these little tent cards up and it would say the dish and the ethnicity, like Kugel, German, mm -hmm. or whatever. And I still remember that. And, and I just, I, I love it. In my profession, there's a concern about cultural foods othering, like there's mainstream foods and then there's cultural foods, which might be African-American or Latino. I've never seen it that way. I think because I was raised in Concord Park, I know every food has a cultural or ethnic story to tell. So I don't see it as othering. I see it as a way that we can learn about each other through food. Speaking of food, uh, there was a gourmet club that eventually um, arose. I don't know if any, your mother was in the gourmet club. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, not unless it includes fish sticks. <laughs> and spam. And spam. And spam. <laughs> well, eventually there was a gourmet club. And speaking about cultural identity and learning about other people, uh, we used to go to Fellowship Farm in the summer. 
And uh, did you did you go yeah. to the Fellowship yeah. Farm? And it was a wonderful place. Pete Seeger. That's where we first learned about Pete Seeger and his guitar and his lovely singing was at Fellowship Farm. And then when we would go there, you would meet people from all over the world and it also have different types of food that you could taste. And so the whole premise of being a child in Concord Park, it was to further your education about other people and how to respect other people. And that was just the most wonderful thing. Great. Okay, those were some lovely memories. Uh, but Concord Park was full of human beings. And so, did somebody else have any? No, 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 no. no. Yeah, and so um, if you would speak a little bit about um, some of the human foibles that you observed as a child in Concord Park. I, I would like to start off with that one because I learned something very interesting just a few years ago. I'm still learning things about Concord Park I didn't know. But we have reporters who come and interview us for book chapters. And these are young people. They could be my kids. And they're still interested in learning about Concord Park. And one of the things I learned from someone who did a real in-depth um, research on Morris Milgram and his legacy was there was concern when Concord Park was established. There was concern from white Quakers. And they felt that there could be some risk with Concord Park because you're putting blacks in the 50s and 60s next to whites who want to be in an integrated neighborhood or are okay with an integrated neighborhood. And that's not necessarily the real world. We discovered that when we moved to Warminster. They didn't want us there. So the concern was you could be creating a confidence in integration that might not necessarily be mirrored in the outside world. And again, I just learned this like five years ago. I, I never thought of that angle or perspective before, but this was something that this, this uh, reporter, when she dug into the research, um, found it. So, so very interesting. Mm -hmm. I don't know that, I don't know under the word foibles, there were, <laughs> it was a diverse community, not just race-wise, but also background-wise. I think the common thread through most of the families was Almost everyone there was a World War II GI. So the, so the guys, white and black, had a, a common speaking point in the sense of, of, of their background and their history, which came out a lot at parties and so forth. And of course, people married people, so there, were the, there was a fairly art, artistic bend to a lot of the people that were there. Um, there, were, there were artists, as Joyce had spoken of, there were, there were musicians, there were, there were, and there was also a, a, a high number of people in the teaching profession. I don't know if that's because teachers, by default, are their knowledge base brings them to other things and they're more open. I don't know, but there were a lot of people in the school and the education area there. So, um, you know, they were adults. And, and I also want to state, we were kids, right? Joyce, not saying Joyce is old, but Joyce <laughs> is the oldest, is the longest resident in the, on the panel. So the average age of the people on this panel when we were in Concord Park is fairly young. So, you know, you're a kid. You look at parents and you go, oh, okay, it's an adult. If the adult says do something, you do it. They say don't do something, then you don't. Or, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but you get the general idea. <laughs> when you mentioned foibles, uh, are you speaking about negative things necessarily or? Um. Whatever you're willing to share. Okay. Well, in that we lived in this bubble, we were very content amongst each other and our families. But outside of the bubble, we were ostracized, basically. Uh, people from outside, at that time, the, the knowledge about diversity was very limited in scope in Trevos, Pennsylvania, and in Ben Salem Township. So, unfortunately, we were referred to as, oh, you're the people from Checkerboard Square. Okay, these white and black people and God knows what else are living over there, you bunch of liberals, a bunch of communists, what are you over there? So we being the children didn't understand that, but uh, that we were kind of labeled that way as these weird people from this weird neighborhood, where are they coming from, from Mars, what are they? Mm -hmm. So uh, that was some of the outside activities. Some, and some of us who went to the public schools, I went to private school, Catholic school, and some of us on the outside really got some knocks and some pings and arrows when we went outside of Concord Park. But 
it was important on us having parents and all of the love and caring that we had to know how to handle that and for myself to teach others about what diversity really means. And I think all of us are pros at doing that. We don't just settle and sit back like, oh, what was me? No, I'm going to instruct you how to be a loving human being too. Because that's what, that's what Morris built him. That man put his life on the line for us. And so I figure that's the least that I can do and I think all of us can do. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that um, I just, this is something else I just realized recently. We were like little soldiers out there. Our parents moved us into white areas in the 1950s and 60s. This, this is new turf for the entire country. And we were just kind of out there on the front lines. And I think as a result, we've carried that with us throughout our lives. And it's been a fascinating journey because when I look at the 60s, that was getting the laws into place, the laws about equality and civil rights, just getting them into the place. My parents lived with Jim Crow. My mother, when she grew up in Washington, D.C., if there were three blacks congregating on a corner, the police would come by and say, break it up. Okay, so this is what she grew up with and now she's in Concord Park. And we, we do try to carry this with us and it certainly can be challenging, but things have changed over time. The civil rights movement of the 60s was not the same as the valuing diversity movement of the 90s. And we just continue to learn and evolve. We all know 2020, the year of the George Floyd civil rights protests, ushered in a whole new level of digging down to what really is preventing us from moving forward with the progress that was made. So it has been fascinating, and I've been glad to be a part of it and still learning as we move along. I, I would like to say something. Go ahead, Jay. I had a friend in Concord Park that he said that we, my, my parents, his parents, cleaned our diapers when we were kids. And I remember moving to Warminster, and I was afraid to invite my friend, who was of color, into Warminster to meet my other friends who were what? And it didn't work out. It just did not. It didn't work. So that's one of the things that I've observed. Yeah. 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 We, there yeah. was a pool called the Highway Pool that was right up the street from us. And we, would, we, we didn't go there a lot because you had to pay to get in. There were five of us. But I remember one time we went, and these white kids were in the pool. And I remember them coming out and saying, does that come off when you get in the water? And we're like, what? And they're like, <laughs> that color on your skin. And we're like, what? So then, then we said, you can touch it. And they were like, oh, no. And so then I was chasing them around like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> And they were all running away. It was great. It was very, very great. Speaking of Concord Park, as I mentioned, or as we have mentioned, about being in the bubble. Well, Levittown, Pennsylvania, I'm yeah. sure you've heard of Levittown, Pennsylvania, which was oh, approximately oh, no more than 10 miles up the route, up Route 1 from Concord Park. Well. That was not an intentionally planned integrated community, whites only. All right, so that being said, I, for one, never went to play with anybody up there. I don't know if anyone here did, but that was like off limits for us. However, the very first black family that moved into Levittown, Miss Daisy Myers, oh, and they went through some horrible oh, situations, mm -hmm. yeah. but it was some of the fathers from Concord Park, and I think some of the fathers here, who, the people here, had to go and sit on her lawn 24-7 to protect Daisy, her husband, and her children. So here again, the ideals of a whole community, DEI diversity, comes from Concord Park, from our experience. That is a, there's a story there worth, it's not the story for today, but there's a story there that the Myers really were on the front line. Because unlike where we had families, there was a collection of families, they were out there by themselves. And uh, the, the, the fathers did go and sit in their living room and sit on their front lawn and, and protect them. And that was everybody. It wasn't, mm -hmm. it wasn't just, I, I want to be clear about something, because the nature of this panel is a little different. I grew up, my best friend was Mark. We weren't friends, we were, we were brothers. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize he was white until I went to school. It was never a conversation. That wasn't how you were taught in Concord Park. They were just, he's your friend, that's it. So the idea of race within the bubble didn't really exist. Mm -hmm. It was, as Lauren stated, there was kind of a shocker 
when you finally got sent off to school. Mm -hmm. But in the bubble, there was no discussion of color mm -hmm. or race. I mean, if there was, it wasn't at our level. It mm -hmm. was never a, a, a thought, a concept, a word that just didn't exist. And so to me, that was the coolest thing about Concord Park. To me, the, the, the fact that you actually grew up realizing that there was no difference. There was just, there were just people, just people. And so that was, I think, the biggest benefit that I took away from that. So, okay. so um, yeah, my dad did go to Levittown. Um, and I remember a, a pretty difficult conversation um, that my parents had with my sister and I about why he went there. And I think it was, um, you know, I mean, I was, I was just a little kid, but I was kind of like, well, why wouldn't they like them? You know, and I think that's where, um, you know, my friendship with Jeff and a lot of the neighbors in Concord Park, and then eventually we did move to Bring Wellid, um, which was a, another kind of exceptional community to grow up in as a kid. Um, Quaker founded, very diverse. But that conversation um, with my parents about the Levittown thing, I mean, I might have been six. Yeah. I'm thinking six, yeah, I was probably six years old. And I still remember it as, as something that was, they were trying to explain to me something that I couldn't understand because it wasn't in my, um, it just wasn't in my wheelhouse of mm -hmm. thought that, you would not like somebody. And sometimes unfortunate things not only happened in Levittown, but right in our own community, such as cross burning on one of the Concord Park neighbors, the Duffins, uh, KKK came and burned across on their front lawn. So there were always people from outside the community who just did not like this this event that was happening here in Bucks County. Who were these people trying to influence us? I think they felt very threatened by us. Instead of embracing what we, what we had done and brought to the community. Speaking of what we brought to the community, by the way, was the bookmobile. Yes. All right, uh. all right. There was no library in Ben Salem Township. So Concord Park, the people in Concord Park started the first bookmobile. And if I can recall correctly, it would come down from the Doylestown Library and each home would have a, we would have a bookshelf, a lovely bookshelf. And each home, the bookmobile would come to your house, and I think it was two weeks at a time, two or three weeks yep. at a time. And then any child or any parent, for that matter, could come to your home because the books were housed at your home for two or three weeks, and you signed out a little car and take your books and come back. The bookmobile would come and take, go to the next home or the next home. Eventually, there was a library in Ben Salem Township, rah, rah. Concord Park, that we started it all. Nice. Yeah, we had a, a panel at Penswood, I think it was back in 2006, with a lot of Concord Park kids with gray hair in their 60s and 70s, but yeah, we were the Concord Park kids. And they asked us that, they said, what did you think of race? And every single one of us at one point said, we didn't think anything of it, mm -hmm. we didn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We, it, it just, it was not an issue that would separate or differentiate us as children. And it really was sad to discover that the rest of the outside world wasn't like keeping, wasn't also progressing towards that. I am old enough to be a grandmother and I thought when I reached this age, when I was a child in Concord Park, I thought by the time I'm this age, everything's gonna be fine. It's not, and that is a disappointment. Uh, so that there's clarification, Penswood is a retirement community. <laughs> I just want to make sure, because she said Penswood, you might be thinking, well, okay, what is that? It's a, run by the Quakers. It's a phenomenal facility. So it was a natural migration point for a lot of the people from Concord Park who, reaching that point where they wanted to retire, they all ended up there. So it was almost like Concord Park 3, because yeah. Bring Weld was Concord Park 2. So it was almost like this, the group just moved over to another spot. Our moms ended up together after Nancy um, married and moved to New Hampshire and lived there for what, 25 years 25, or something? 25 years, yeah. And then she and my mom ended up in Penswood together for their final years. And the cool thing about Penswood is it always had events and things going on and it pulled the Concord Park kids back together again as adults. 
and we'd hang out there and have dinner and watch movies and, and the, it's beautifully laid out and you know it, it was a really really nice experience and Penswood is it's a Quaker run facility so as my sister said a lot of our very positive experiences are because of Quaker values and I, I just want to mention outside of not having a library in Ben Salem Township there was no kindergarten and I think one of these lovely people would like to speak to who started the first kindergarten. Let me just say something real quick about Penswood. I think uh, my mom said that um, there were a lot of Concord Park and Bring Wellard residents that, that were at Penswood. And she felt that it was um, such an important part of their lives, Concord Park and Bring Wellard, and the connections that they made in Concord Park and Bring Wellard were so strong that they want that my mom, who was living in New Hampshire for 25 years, wanted to reunite with those people um, because she felt such a strong connection. I agree. Okay. Kindergarten. I, I mentioned the kindergarten before my mom started the kindergarten. She was trained as a teacher and she wanted to have a teacher. And then also um, that way she could keep all of her kids <clears throat> near. And, and I know from being a mother, kindergartens aren't all there. Some of them are all day, but it, it was helpful to have her run the kindergarten. And then all of us as kids entered school through the kindergarten. So I am still in higher education. I've been in school since I was three years old. And I am <laughs> still there. And that's, that's, um, she is a tribute to that love of learning and the ability to learn things. And she was, she was very active with the community and very active with the kids. It was a really nice place to be. It was very good. Which is the natural segue. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> the kindergarten gets started. It was a lovely kindergarten. We had a lot of really good toys, uh, refrigerator boxes. Uh, we had uh, some cartons. Uh, I think we had an old, we might even had an old refrigerator. In fact, we had an old steering wheel. Oh, yeah. Steering wheel. Nice. Anyway, it was, it was top of the line. Uh, but anyway, so the kindergarten starts. So um, Nancy Schmally uh, and my mother were both involved. My mom started, and I believe Nancy was the event coordinator or something like that, yeah, that. Some position in the kindergarten. So they decide that the best way to entertain these kids is a puppet show. That's the way they're going to do it. This is a Mrs. Schmally, uh, and, and I want to be clear. Mrs. Schmally insisted forever to say, Jeff, my name is now Mrs. Penny, but I'm sorry. <laughs> 50 <laughs> years of Mrs. Schmally, I can't cut that over. So anyway, so she's um they she comes to my mother and says oh i read this thing in women's day magazine by bill baird on how to do a puppet show my mom is somewhat skeptical of this process and says so that doesn't seem like the world's best idea but mrs schmally insists that this is a great idea and so they proceed with the idea of doing it and of course bill baird had written all the instructions how to build the puppets here's the story blah 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 this becomes a massive community event. The puppets are, they, they involve all these other people to, to build the puppets. So there's, it's not just Mrs. Schmally and Mrs. Swan, it's Mrs. Mims and Mrs. Hadley and uh, the Bytels and there's the, the, the Lawrences. This is like a gigantic community event to make this puppet show. So they create the puppet show and they're gonna have it one evening uh, in the backyard. And as Mark said, the reason why he said no fences was there were no fences. There, were no. there was, you could walk down from the top of the block to the end of the block through everybody's backyard. There was no, it, there was nothing to stop you and no one would. So they decided they're gonna put it in the backyard. So they set it up. Uh, I think they used the refrigerator box for the stage. I'm pretty certain that was the case. They put the refrigerator box up, they need music. So Nettie Mae Hare, who lived across the back and slightly down from us, she actually lived behind what was the Fagel, the Fagleys. Fagleys. The Fagleys. So they moved it, the, the place down so that they could get it near her house because what she did was she pulled the piano to the back window so she could play the piano and sing while they were doing the thing, which was in the backyard. I, I was there, I don't really recall it, but this must have been a phenomenal event. Anyway, <laughs> the, the, they complete the, the initial puppet show. It's a massive hit. Everybody loves it. And I think they loved it too. So they decided that, well, we should do another. And I don't really know if they went first to Shriners. I know that the story is that they then went to Shriners Hospital and performed it. I, 
I'm not certain that was the next stop, but it doesn't matter. Somewhere in there, they took this massive structure to Striner's Hospital and did another puppet show. And then, then it's sort of, oh, oh wow, we're, we're doing really well. So then they went to a kindergarten and then they went to another kindergarten and hence the story starts because at that point they've now decided they're practically pros. They've done three shows. So <laughs> off, they, <laughs> off they went. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Great. Lauren, do you, uh, go ahead. Go do ahead. any of you remember that first show and how did you like it if you do? Uh, I don't really, I can't say I do. You might remember, Joyce. I, I just remember because their mother always had me as the coordinator of all these children. <laughs> Joyce, you sit down there, Joyce, and make sure they're behaving. <laughs> so. Oh, the tough task. <laughs> and that was. <laughs> that was very tough, yes. So I remember just sitting on the lawn with, and watching this box because I had to, you know, watch the puppets and, the, and I was just intrigued by the box. But also I had to mind all of you and make sure that you were behaving and everything. So that's, I just have a, you know, a, a vague memory of that because your mother always had me baby, I babysat you all. That's and the there's not only you all, but I had to babysit the other children, you know, everybody, everybody who was in your immediate circle, I had to just make certain that everybody behaved. Yes. Yeah. yeah, one of the things my mom used to say when she was rehearsing, she said, if you kids started leaving the room, I know that I had to redo the script or the music because you were bored and you didn't want to pay attention. She yes. told us that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And I think one of my favorite shows uh, as a child with the original Wonderland Puppet Theater was the Carnival of the Animals. I learned a lot about classical music from my mother's puppet shows. When I went on into junior high and all, when you study music, I knew that song, I knew that, you know, and that was from the Carnival of the Animals. And the things they did, like they would get the punch tickets from the turnpike and throw it out, and with the fluorescent lighting, it looked like water. They did all these creative things with, with this show. It, you know, as a child, you just kind of assume that's the way it is, but when I reflect back on it now, they were pretty darn amazing, what, what they were able to put together. I knew how to make paper mache. My mother made these puppets out of scraps of fabric. They, they rarely bought anything brand new. They used, you know, renewable resources back in the 60s, so. Well, really, really amazing experience. And, and to your point about classical music, because here I am, I'm nine years older than my siblings at the time, and a lot older than you guys, but what I enjoyed about listening to my mother, who was uh, the puppeteer for the Sorcerer's Apprentice and the, the, the Night Corkers, was the classical music, because my mother loved classical music. I mean, she was not a rock and roller. Here I am, the rock and roll generation, but you know, she taught me to appreciate classical music. And then when I listened to the, all the puppet scenarios, it was always classical music, which I really appreciate. And I, and I knew the songs because my mother played, you know, she listened to this music on WFLN, plus she had the big, was it 33 and a third records and all that type of thing. So yes, it was a very cultural thing. We, you know, we weren't, it was cultural, all the puppet shows. So it, it felt in the very beginning, um, our job was to be the audience and as Lauren said if we got bored you know they could tell but I also remember very well saying hey I see your arm <laughs> you know we, we were and that would Sorry. be that would be the highlight like I remember sitting there going I'm looking for some I'm looking for some forearm if I see it man I'm gonna I'm gonna tell them right away because that was my job and um, so I think sometimes I probably got a little lost in the puppet show, but I was all about watching for mistakes. And I was like, oh, I caught you on that one, Mom, you know. Right, and they also, they had something they used to do with a puppet called Dimples called Theater Manners. And at the beginning of the show, they would teach things like be quiet and when to clap. And you can look behind the stage later, but don't try to come behind the stage now. And I remember her uh, dimples, hello boys, hello girls, <laughs> hello parents, hello everyone. And mom said sometimes dimples would keep singing because whoever was supposed to do the next thing wasn't doing it right. <laughs> she, after a show, my mother could tell you every mistake because she knew, but the audience didn't know. Mm -hmm. The show usually went fine. Mm -hmm. But of course, that's, that's for any of us who do presentations or performances, we always know what we could have done to make it better. 
But yeah, she could always point out, well, we should have started the tape here or whatever. And it's, I just want to be clear here. Not every show went perfect. <laughs> <laughs> right, the, uh, and some of them, the some of them, we were actually quite aware they didn't go perfect. The, the marionettes <laughs> with, uh, what was her name? Dorothy Pierce. Dorothy, Dorothy Pierce. Pierce, yes. One of the legs was hanging during a show. You know, with a marionette. I don't know if you guys know marionettes or not, but it was. It was. I remember seeing that show, and they were laughing. I was like, "Uh oh, yeah. something went wrong mind. here." Dorothy Pierce would pre-record all of the shows, and then you would just do the puppets. And my mom did not like doing that. And in this one particular show, while the background was running, the music and the script, the marionette leg got stuck. So he leaves the stage with his leg stuck and comes back with it dragging. Right. <laughs> yeah, there was some trouble. But, but I, I want to be clear. The early show, the Shriner show, uh, the stage fell over. So that probably didn't look all that good uh, uh, on that one. And then when they were actually performing at the, in Ontario, no, yes, in Ontario, they were performing no, it wasn't Ontario. It was the one before that. The the puppet convention before conference before that, the sixty three, I guess, or sixty four. They uh in form, in front of Jim Henson. They were very impressed that Jim Henson was there in the audience. And they were doing the Sorcerer's Apprentice. They had left the Magic Onion because of the fact that Bill Baird had contacted them and stated that what he had published in Women's Day was for them to do for free. <laughs> <laughs> so he sent a note basically saying, if you're going to collect money on it, there, we have to have a conversation. So they abandoned that play, and they went on to The Sorcerer's Apprentice. They were originally using water for the cauldron. They had water in the cauldron. And according to my mom, she turned the wrong way and knocked the cauldron over, so the dry ice and all the water spilled all over the stage. And then Mrs. Schmally, in somewhat of a panic, stopped the music, so they went around to the front. This, I was there, I do not recall this, but they went around to the front and they said to Mr. Henson, what do we do now? And Mr. Henson's famous reply was, keep going. We're not here for this. You know, we want to see the rest of the show. So they, not all the shows went perfectly. There were some troubles. But um, they were pretty uh, intrepid in their thing. And I do believe that their... their commitment to inventiveness, which was driven, in my opinion, by the fact that they were really cheap, not so much that they were being inventive. But, um, you know, we all learned to work with paper hangers and paper mache and tennis balls and stuff like that. And I think anybody on this panel, if given a couple of pieces, could assemble a puppet in probably four or five minutes without a problem. So, Yeah, I once did a, a paper puppet bag show at that <laughs> dinner table. They loved it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I went to a puppet show that my mom did in the 80s. This was when she was Alice's um, Wonderland of Puppets. And kids were a little different then. And I remember her. It was a, at a German club, and it was a Christmas show. She got a lot of those. My mom could clean up with pocket money at Christmas time because she would do a couple shows on the weekends for, like, YMCA or Breakfast with Santa or something. And uh, I remember her with the puppet at the top saying, Go back, boys and girls, go back, because the kids were coming up to the closer, stage. Closer, yeah. And I think it was because, again, it was the 80s, it wasn't the 60s, so things were a little bit looser. But this German club, it was this Christmas, happened to be the last weekend before the Christmas. And I think those parents just let those kids go because they had it. We all know how kids can get leading up to Christmas. I think they were relieved to be in a room where the kids could just run around and do whatever. But my mom was like, go back, boys and girls. Go back. So, yes. Not everything went as smoothly as she would have liked. She also that. had me in the uh, garage of the warm house. She used to practice the show with Mrs. Molly. And she would have me sit out there like, a, like an audience and see if I saw anything that went wrong during the show. So, so prepare her for the next show. So I do remember that there were times I was so much into it. When I was a kid, I would make a cardboard box, a, a refrigerator cardboard box into a stage. I just cut a square out and I would stand and uh, practice. And there were times where 
I had a friend from school and another friend come over and we would do line in the mouse together uh, with my mom's puppets from what I knew how to do it from seeing the show we practice in the in the garage as well so there was a there was a lot of good times uh, I had with my mom um, I would go with her to set up stage different puppet shows uh, and you know they had all her puppets and suitcases and I would carry them and there was a time I think she actually paid me or got, you know she would buy me lunch or whatever <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> I think, yeah, I, I really do. I think, I think there was a time that actually it was when uh, at Alice's birthday, her your friend's birthday party. I got paid for that. <laughs> I, I could have sworn I got paid for it, but I would help her set up, and you know, I would help her with the shows. It was, it was really neat for me and everybody. And I know when we did it the first time with Alla. She wanted to help, so she started to help out. So it was just very, it was entertaining for everybody. Yeah, and we talk about this stage. When I used to tell my friends, my mom's a puppeteer, oh, she has her own theater? I said, yeah, where is it? In the, in the state, back of her station wagon. <laughs> if you saw this stage before she put it together, it looked like a bunch of scrap wood. But she would tell you, put this clamp here, do this, do this. And then when she draped it and put the lights up, it was amazing. And one of our Concord Park neighbors, Ray Wilkins, was into um, electronics. And remember the Sony reel to reels? He mm. would do their soundtracks. They were beautiful. So it really was something that the research and the details and what they went into to come up with, um, you know, a really good show. It, it she, had, she had a push button that she would push to activate something in the puppet show. So she was using her hands, reading a script, at the same time she was hitting that push button with her foot. <laughs> and just one more thing, my mom used to, in the Warminster house, used to set the stage up in the garage on Halloween night, and the kids would come into the garage and she'd do like a little thing before they got their candy. And it, the kids loved it. They loved coming by our house for Halloween, so this, performance thing was just in her. She just liked doing it. I just want to mention that I had the privilege and the opportunity to, to be behind the stage for the, one of the last times with Alice and some of you were at Bringwellet. Bringwellet was uh, having an anniversary and so Alice went over to Bringwellet, set up the stage and I had never done, I think I had my mother's, one of my mother's, the, the night corkers, that's what I did, but the one that my mother did and Alice just, she said, keep going, keep going Joyce, keep going, keep going, because I didn't have my hand up far enough or something like that, but I was so privileged to do one show with Alice. Right, we, we would pack, to, they'd pack things in the station wagon. This is something they could never get away with today. There would be a space this big for any kid traveling with. They called it the capsule. <laughs> this, yeah, you'd be in there like this with all this puppetry <laughs> stage equipment, and I'm telling you, that would not go over today with, with safety standards, but we survived, right? We lived. <laughs> we lived. We lived. Mm -hmm. So I think one thing that um, was interesting, I, um, when I think of puppetry and I think of what happens behind the screen, it, uh, it does seem kind of like a dance. And uh, both Alice and Nancy um, love to dance um, and at weddings and et cetera, et cetera. And then Alice was quite the tap dancer. And what was the name of her tap dance group? And toe right? tappers. Toe tappers. Toe tappers. Toe tappers. Toe tappers. Doyle's yeah. Town Toe Tappers. Yeah. And uh, I remember um, at different times, you know, because my mom would always keep me updated on what was happening with the swans when she was in New Hampshire, because I was in the Adirondacks, and uh, and my mom would say, "Oh, Alice just did this new performance, and etc." So, I always thought of the behind the scenes um, puppetry because when they started, they had a lot of community members in the um, involved, and then I think they figured. Wow, I mean, not everybody can make it. It's kind of like when you're in, when you're in a rock and roll band mm -hmm. and the drummer doesn't show up. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, it kind of it's hard to perform without your drummer. So mm -hmm. I think they had some experiences where they were like, "Wow, we got too many people. I think we should just have the two of us do all the puppets." And then I think it was Carnival Animals where they had a whole bunch of different puppets, and they they used to hang them on the hooks. And if you see the the hooks are still on the puppets. 
and they would go from puppet to puppet and they, mm -hmm. you know, all over and they'd be moving around. And, and I just always um, thought that was, that was great that they liked to dance and interact in that way because it was a dance. There was music um, and then, my, you know, my mom for years was a folk dance um, instructor and did folk dance and just loved to dance. And um, I think that that dance aspect um, was kind of an interesting part of being a puppeteer um, because, you know, there's footwork involved and there's arm movements and things like that, so. And, and it, it should be said, um, I agree with Mark, one of the, in my opinion, the coolest parts of going to a show in the later 60s when they had really gotten their act down was that at the end of the show, they would do the show and then they would take the curtain down so that the, the people could see what they were doing and they would do a piece of the show again. And you got to see, because there was, it's hard to, to imagine today the complications involved then because not only were there two people and the stage wasn't very wide. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like it the was. stage, it was maybe as, as wide as this table. You have two maybe. women behind them. They're doing this thing with their hands and at the time they had wired microphones. So instead of twisting around because then they had to constantly get twisted up in the microphone cable, they would actually unjack the microphone and move to the next jack and then plug it back in. They had to do this while holding up the puppet, grabbing the next puppet, not bumping into the person. So yeah. it really was, it was my favorite part of the show. It was actually the one thing I was like, yeah, okay, I've seen all that stuff. Let's get right to the important thing. And uh, that was the, the cool part. And I agree with Mark. I think they found that to be truly the enjoyable part. The, yeah, that was the, that was the challenge. Yeah, that yeah. was the challenge. That was the and challenge. Looking at, uh, we saw a performance yesterday, and I think what was interesting, you know, he had all kinds of high tech um, things. It was a beautiful performance, the three pigs, and but he had lights and cameras and you know, and he said it took him three hours to set it up and um, which I think it, it took my mom and, and Alice three hours to set up their stage. Just, but that was just because it was like hinged here and little <laughs> clamps and I mean, it was, it was crazy. Um, but yeah, I think that the um, you know, the fact that they didn't have all of the technological, you know, I mean, in the beginning, they, they put a record on, yeah. so they had to queue up the, I mean, imagine, all of these things happen, you're queuing up the record, and then you have to time it between the two seconds before it actually kicks in, and, and so I, I believe they were great improvisational puppeteers, right. and I think you maybe had to be better at that back then, because there were just lots of things that would go wrong. Things would get caught on things. I'm sure current day puppeteers have the same, the same issues. Um, but I think that, you know, the soundtracks and, and I do remember my mom saying, yeah, we didn't like it to be canned, the whole thing canned, because they wanted to be able to, to, to change if, if they were on a roll uh, with something and everybody was laughing hysterically, they wanted to go with that because they were truly performing for the audience. Yes. It wasn't them, them. Correct. it was for the audience. Yeah, they were, very, they were doing it. They were and very much into the fact that they were performing for the people in front. And while I never discussed with my mother or Mrs. Schmally the idea of why they didn't like it, they were very emphatic about they didn't like it to be canned. But they were very, if you went to a show if you went to a show of an elementary school or whatever and the crowd was interacting with them, they would adjust the show to the crowd's interaction. So it didn't matter what the story was. If they were, they were getting feedback, they would adjust the show to the feedback. And that's why some of the shows that were the simplest, the dance contest, which was probably the simplest one that they had, was one of the ones that they enjoyed the most because the whole idea of the dance contest allowed for people to interact. They, people would shout out stuff <laughs> it was and they could react to that because the show didn't really have a structure really it was kind of goofy but but they loved that they loved the fact that they could they could respond to what someone would say and there's more than once that they would uh, a child would yell something out and you would hear something back from <laughs> behind the stage a response to the child's statement so th they did really really like that so one, one thing that was interesting too they performed uh wh uh the world around us and I, I remember 
you know, this was a TV program that was filmed live, and um, they were they were kind of nervous, but there was no audience. Yeah. And so Jeff and I were the audience, um, but we weren't really audience. You know, yes. we were we weren't a normal <laughs> audience. And so this was one of their biggest uh, performances. They were on TV. Um, it was a big deal. And I remember my mom being pretty nervous about the whole thing. Um, and the fact that there was no audience, so they weren't getting the feedback, made it a little more challenging um, for them. And it, it turned out, um, who was it? Anita Cleaver, Anita Cleaver was her name. She yes. was the woman. And I remember talking to Anita Cleaver, just a side note uh, out of that. Anita Cleaver afterwards was asking Jeff and I, says, well, what do you boys do? I think we were probably 10 or 11 at the time. And I, I said, well, I collect turtles. <laughs> and so then about a month later, I get a phone call, or my mom gets a phone call, and she says, Mark, go get all the kids. And this is, at this point, we were living in Bringwell. She says, get all the kids. She says, I got an announcement. And I'm like, announcement what are you she says and then she gets everybody together and she says I I just got a phone call from Anita Cleaver she wants you boys to go on the world around us and race turtles yes yes one of the best days of my life <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, we we had a good time we actually went on TV we put the turtles in a thing and we raced we went on a couple times and she gave us all kinds of prizes, prizes. and it was it yeah. was fantastic pleasure the, the but, world around so. us was a special treat but we had to get up like five o'clock in the morning to get up to City Line Avenue because we went from Warminster with the frogs we when we yeah, moved to Warminster yeah, there was a ditch behind us and all these frogs so we had frog jumping contests. Races. But we races. But but we were often we were invited a couple different times. And to me the coolest thing was after the taping, we got a free breakfast at the Marriott across the street. And that was a big deal because eating out was a big deal back then. You did not just order out a couple nights a week right. because you didn't feel like cooking. Um, the other thing is the stage, the most interesting thing. They spent a lot of time with the setup. So they had hooks and they had puppets in certain places and they had the script. If they didn't have a second show after the first one, you could just take that stuff down and put it in any suitcase. But if they had a second show, you had to carefully take everything down, put it in the organized places because you had to set it back up again. And that's one of the reasons that the shows flowed so smoothly. They, the details that they thought out to me were just incredible. And I, I remember speaking about turtles. One of my latest mom show was Yurgle the Turtle. Mm -hmm. I remember that. I don't know if you have that on record. Yes. But yes, I, I remember the show. I remember when she made it. I cannot remember the details of it because it was like what, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's right. The the turtles, a turtle would go on top of each turtle, and then. I think it was the highest turtle or something. They were king of the, the king. king of the pond. Yeah, the yeah, highest the pond. turtle was the king of the pond, so they just kept trying to get higher mm -hmm. until, of course, they toppled over. Mm -hmm. And there was also another show, wasn't it Sambo? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I remember mm -hmm. the show Sambo. And that was towards the end of my mom's career. Mm -hmm. She was doing stuff like that on her own. Yes. Yeah. I, I think, Allah, how many years did you get a puppet show at your birthday party? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everyone? Yeah. 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 And I got one at my birthday party too, yeah. not just you. <laughs> <laughs> at my 50th birthday party, I invited all the professors from, and the graduate students from Lehigh University, and they came, my mom did a puppet show in the basement, and I had professors asking me years, and when are you gonna do another puppet show? When are you gonna, that was really, really great, that was so neat, so, yeah, it was uh, a unique thing, sorry. Yeah, we had one year, we used to have a big family Christmas Eve party, and when my mom and my dad split and she moved to a townhouse in Ben Salem, a bunch of people from the old gang came. And we were sitting around talking about her show so much, she said, do you all want a puppet show? Went into the back room, set the stage up, and did a puppet show. <coughs> Everyone loved it, and we were all young adults, and we weren't expecting it that night. It, it was really something. Mm -hmm. Great. Good, I'm going to jump in here. Um, and ask this question precisely about your mother's careers. In the early 60s, press coverage referred to your mothers as Mrs. Raymond Schmally and Mrs. James Swan. 
In this time period, women were not expected to pursue careers, especially not as artists. Even today, puppetry is not widely regarded as a serious profession. What did you, your family, and other kids at school think about your mother's work as puppeteers? Well, I'll go first. Okay. <clears throat> Just the fact that, you know, my mom has, like Mark and Jeff was sharing about the coordination and the way they did stuff with their puppet shows was amazing. I think, um, well, I'm going to take a little risk here. Okay. My father is not here, so I cannot <laughs> speak for him. I can speak to him, but I cannot speak for him. He was not thrilled. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that's a pretty good assessment. Yes. He was not that happy with the puppet show situation. In fact, he pretty much hated it. Um, but uh, to that end, he, you know, they, they didn't agree. Of course, they didn't really agree on anything. Um, but uh, it went on anyway. I don't know that, it should also be stated, I'm not 100% certain if and when it could be stated that my mom's career was solely puppets. Mm -hmm. She was a, a, an employed teacher. So um, I don't know. That's a question we'd have to ask her, and that would be very difficult at this time. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I don't know of anybody who really had a uh, an issue with it. It seemed like, and as you began began to know the puppeteering community, which, if you went to a conference like this or whatever, there were lots and lots of women. Mm -hmm. So while while puppeteering may have been in, uh, considered to a certain extent somewhat of an odd direction to go in, in the sense of the general people. I mean, if you talk to people now, you guys are puppeteers. If you talk to people now, I'm of a puppeteer, it's not, it's not a common phrase. But um, I don't think anybody had a problem with it. I mean, we didn't have a problem with it. We were like, yeah, whatever you want to do, right? I mean, yeah, there's no I really an issue. I, um, you might, no one who knows me now might believe this. I was actually a very quiet and shy child. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, I remember at St. Chris, my mom arranged to do a puppet show. I can't remember if it was for a class or whatever. And after it was over, the nun was like, Lauren, you didn't tell us your mother was a puppeteer. And my friends were like, wow, you're so lucky. And I'm thinking so, you know, because it's just something that I grew up with. But yes, I have to this day. I have put things on Facebook about this weekend, and I have friends in my Facebook group going, wow, that's really cool, that is so neat. You know, you're, that you're really fortunate, and I, I didn't know they'd be impressed. <laughs> I just want to say, uh, for the Ben Salem community, every time Alice Swan's name was mentioned, it is synonymous with puppetry. Oh, you know Alice Swan? Is she still doing the puppets? Her name was all over Ben Salem, in Bucks County for that matter, because she went all over Bucks County. And she was known as being the, this wonderful puppeteer with the Wonder, and they knew the name, the Wonderland Puppet Theater, and from whence it came. So your mother was famous. She was famous in Bucks County. And she loved that. <laughs> <laughs> and it has to be stated that they did achieve a certain level, because the, the puppet show uh, with my mother and Mrs. Schmally did do how, for four years? Four years on Story, Story Corner? Story Corner, yeah. So that was... they, they were booked in on the Channel 12, which was the PBS or public, uh, public, the, television, the, station. Yeah, public television station, as the, um, and a woman used the phrase just recently, the insertionalist. I'd never heard that phrase, but she said that when puppets are used to, to bring in or cover the gap between the intro and the and the the story they're called insertionalists. I don't know. Anyway, so they would have a puppet. Uh, the puppets are downstairs. Dimples was a big guy. Um, Toby the dog was used. Yep, um, one or two of the of the hunters from uh, the Peter and the Wolf and were Wolf. used, and she would, they would bring them up. And I always get her name wrong. Not the last name. Will it? Willa Dean. 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 I always say Willa Dean. Willa Dean. Willa Dean. Willa Dean. That's right. Miss, Miss Willie. Miss Willie. Would, would come on and she would, it was Story Corner, so she would read stories to the kids. And the puppets were booked as the puppets that would introduce or, inter, or interface with her leading up to the story. So, in, and the local level, they had achieved a fairly significant position. And not to go back on it, but 
the um, Anita Cleaver show was like the morning, like the local Today show. Mm -hmm. It was it was a it was on Channel Six. It was, and everybody watched it. It was a, a kind of a big deal. So so when they had achieved that level, they had sort of cert, definitely achieved a certain level of local fame in the sense of who they were. And there weren't, you know, this is back when Sherry Lewis was was the big thing. This is pre Jim Henson. Keep in mind, Sesame Street hadn't started yet, mm -hmm. so. Um, this was all unique and new, and and then he figured out the magic sauce and carried that forward. But these were people on TV before there was Jim Henson, before there was a Sesame Street. All in education, they were all doing educational things. So, so. Uh, was Willa Jean Dane a squeegee? Did no, no, squeegee was one of the puppets. Uh, was, no, I mean she wasn't, but that's she did squeegee yes, for squeegee. A Willa Jean Dane. Yes, yes, yes. Squeegee was a puppet where they took, it was almost like a Brillo pad or something. It was like a scrubber that you used. It was a copper scrubber for the dishes, and that was Squeegee's head. <laughs> that, that is what they did. Again, they were incredibly resourceful. Resourceful or cheap. Whatever, whichever one you like. Whichever one you get was it, was it a doll? So I wanted to just say real quick, I th it was interesting. We were talking about how um, Nancy and Alice, um, when they started, and then they got involved with Puppeteers of America and went to some of the puppetry um, festivals. Um, I think it was kind of like girls' night out. Yeah. They, yeah. they felt, and, and they had such a strong bond, Aunt Nancy and Alice, that, um, you know, they, they loved their children dearly, but boy, they liked getting away too, <laughs> you know? And so this was an opportunity for them um, through puppetry, which they were, you know, in love with puppetry as, as well as as their families, um, but I'm 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 not sure, you know, um, both um, our moms, um, you know, got divorced, and so I think um, their friendship um, and their wanting to spend time together and and probably talk about their jerk husbands. I don't know, <laughs> you know, I mean, they, um, sorry, Dad, but, um, <laughs> you know, they, they, they probably commiserated some and, and said, did, did Jim do that? I don't know. What did Ray do? Did he, Ray, did he did that? Really? Yeah. You know, so I think there was a camaraderie that they found with puppeteering that um, just, you know, grew and grew, yeah. and I think that, um, you know, it's interesting when I think of um, kind of the other things they did, you know, they were not able to, I mean, maybe they paid for the gas money being puppeteers, but they really didn't make a lot of money. They always had, my mom was the director of volunteer services at Holy Redeemer Hospital, and, and Alice was teaching at the time, and, and so, you know, they were all, they, they were gainfully employed, um, and then doing puppetry on as the side the side gig, um, but um, you know I wonder as I, I kind of go around here and I, I look at maybe some of the puppeteers w that are actually um, making a living as a as a puppeteer. It, it's got to be extremely difficult, um, and it's got to be a true labor of love. And I think that you know they were fortunate, you know, that they had. Um, you know, husbands who had the financial means to allow them to uh, go to these <coughs> festivals and, um, you know, take part in their puppetry pastime um, and their their creative outlet um, that I think was just, I don't know, I mean, partially some of what they really lived for was mm -hmm. to, to do that and perform, and I think that um, you know, some of the other things that, you know, my mom did with folk dancing and, and leading other activities, she probably got some of that, because um, my mom also said that she was kind of a timid, younger person, and I think through puppetry that um, enabled her to feel more confident and to teach folk dancing and to do things like that, that um, maybe without puppetry, who <coughs> knows, what, what would have happened. would have what, what they would have done, done you know I, so. I have to agree completely I, yeah. I mentioned that yesterday in the in the other presentation someone asked a very very 
insightful question about, well, what did you learn about your mother in putting together the show that is downstairs? And my comment was I didn't really learn much about her, but much new, but I believe she learned a lot about herself in doing that. I think she, I agree with Mark 100%. I believe puppetry brought her, brought them both a level of confidence, and that confidence then allowed them to do more and more things, and it led them to explore other areas. I, I have to agree. That's and one other thing it could be helpful to remember with what Jeffrey and Mark are sharing, our mothers were 1950s housewives and mothers. This was before the 1960s women's rights and civil rights movement that they began their journey as a wife and mother. Very different mindset. And they had to mix both worlds, the worlds of them wanting to get out there and be independent and make a name for themselves in addition to, uh, you know, being the expectations of a wife and mother at that time. Um, Nancy once told me that Ray wasn't that distressed about it, but she said um, Alice was always upset because she had to cook food ahead of time and put it in the fridge and make all these notes about what was going to be for dinner, and, and Jimmy was just so, you know, you're going to be away and what, what isn't going to get done. So they had to juggle all of that, which was a very different world. Right? I think it was... Um my mom being a puppeteer with Mark's mom was kind of like their hobby, you know, that that was their calling, that's how I feel. Like today, people have certain things they do. They work and then they play and they do whatever they want to do, join like the YMCA or, you know, take karate or ski. And I think at that time, that's what it was for my mom and, and Mark's mom. So I think what's interesting too is that they, um, kind of lost my thought there. But yeah, they, they were able to, um, you know, do the puppetry as, as that sidelight. And I, I think having five kids is harder than having two. So I think my mom, my mom probably had a little more time to, uh, you know, um, and, and my dad was pretty chill. Um, so I think he was probably just like, oh yeah, sure, I'll, I'll watch the kids for the weekend or something like that. Um, but one other story that I, I did want to just tell um, that my mom told me um, at Penswood, and I had never really heard this before, there was a library that they went to, I believe in Bucks County, and when they showed up, um, my mom did a lot of the uh, logistical setup of the, making the phone calls, and probably because she, made, she had more time. But anyhow, they showed up, and when the person at the library realized that Alice was black, um, she asked that they not um, like come out afterwards. And my mom said, no. She said, absolutely not. Um, and I think that, um, you know, that was really powerful. And it, it's funny, she, did, she never told me that until later. And I think that, um, you know, when approached, I think my mom was just like, you know, no way. I, I would never, we are not going to change uh, our values for you. And, and I, it's not written anywhere. Um, it, and I've been through most of the documents that we've used in, in putting together. They, they make no mention in anything explicitly about how that must have gone, what that must have happened. Yeah. It, there's, there's no way. You, you couldn't be a black and a white woman traveling around in 1963 and not have run into that. But there's nothing, there's nothing noted. I didn't know that story until you told me. Yeah, I, it's, and it's, it was uh, a Penswood, actually. Yeah, and, and so, uh, yeah. There, there must have been that, but that wasn't, uh, that wasn't the thing. I, not to go back to Concord Park, but I think that one of the things about Concord Park is hard to convey is you would leave the bubble and there would be some pain, but then you would come home to the bubble, right? Right. right? right. So you'd go out and you get things did not go well. You'd go to school and maybe it didn't go well. You'd ride your bike, maybe that didn't go well either. But you would come back to the bubble, and the bubble would then take you back in, and you would be safe and well again. So I assume that that was true for them too. But I think so. I, I again, it's an assumption. They're not here. Can't ask. But that's yeah. My I also <laughs> want to point out my mom earned her master's, and my mom and I 
completed our master's the same year in 1983. So she was working full time, five kids, I think a couple, Jeffrey and Jennifer might have been gone by then, and doing the puppetry on the side and earned a master's degree. I mean, I, and a husband that wasn't all that supportive. So that again, that's pretty darn amazing and phenomenal. I just want to mention my mother, Marjorie, uh, she did not know the first thing about puppetry. And I think what intrigued her about becoming a small part of the Wonderland Puppet Theater was the excitement, the adventure, watching Alice. Alice was the one that coaxed her. Come on, Marge, you can do it. Because, you know, my mother had no idea about puppetry, but it was your mother that encouraged her to take a part in the Wonderland Puppet Theater, which she immensely enjoyed because my mother liked all things new. That was the whole purpose of she and my father moving to Concord Park, to experience new things, of which she went on to become an integral part of other community-related events in Concord Park. My mom may have done that to avoid paying you for the babysitting. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to, want to point that out. <laughs> they were cheap. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that's really beautiful. Uh, we're going to open the floor to questions, but this might be the point to uh, bring in the, the anthem. Oh. Yes? Oh. So I'll, I'll just set that up. Oh, you better say the middle part. Yeah. All right. Before, because I'm going to take a very low point in this because I don't actually know all the words. I only know the intro and the ending. But when they did, uh, when the Bill Baird show arrived in Women's Day, there was a concept of the song. It was not actually completed. It was not that they, this was actually created by Nettie Mae Hare, the woman across, who was a Juilliard graduate. And they came to her and said, we need a song for the tune. And uh, she, as I understand it, she wrote uh, the song. Uh, the concept was delivered, but she wrote the song. And then they went and took the song and had it recorded in Philadelphia, the recording studio. It's interesting, uh, not only is the song known by anybody who was ever involved in the Wonderland Puppet Theater and is sung constantly at Thanksgiving and Christmas and whenever more than two people get together who were part of that. At her funeral. At her funeral, yeah. it was sung. Yeah, right. yeah. However, but more importantly, the words of the song are could not be more spot on to everything we've discussed. That's right. It literally is the anthem of everything we've been discussing. Mm -hmm. I cannot express how, as a man of my age, how many times I have referenced the song to people, as Joyce said, when you're trying to educate them mm -hmm. about what is the way to be a decent human being. The words of this song, a kid's song in a puppet show, in the first puppet show they ever did, is, is literally, there is nothing better. So with that, further ado. Do we want to start singing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everybody yeah. ready? Okay. The well, things we don't understand are the things that we're afraid of, but we're no longer afraid when we find out what they're made of. A look in the book and a pinch of salt stops the magic onion cold. The night corkers too didn't know what to do, so they crawled right back in their holes. The things we don't understand are the things that we're afraid of. But we're no longer afraid when we find out what they're made of. When we find out what they're made of. Boom, boom. Okay, Thank so you. if there are any questions from the audience, we have about 25 minutes. People are like, oh my God. Oh my God, I remember <laughs> all that stuff. What were you talking Here's about? Here's a question. <laughs> While the envious of your childhood, uh, I grew up in one of those proverbial blue white suburbs, and it wasn't much of a community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm.
Duct tape? Any duct tape? <laughs> no. And no, it was masking tape. Masking, masking tape. tape. Masking tape. Masking tape. Masking that tape. belongs to the theater. That was masking tape. That's right. right. There you go. I was on a Zoom the other night, a business Zoom, not a client, but I serve on a board um, in the dietetics group. But they said, grab something near your computer and explain it. That was the icebreaker. So I grabbed one of those little, it looks like a, a duster, and you use it to dust off the keyboard. And I said, we're honoring my mom this weekend, and this reminds me of something she would say, I need that for the puppet show. Because she, certain things would work beautifully as props. Right. And I remember when I bought it, I thought, this is a puppety thing. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. I don't think so. I, 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 Concord Park, it's so intricate, it's so involved, intertwined with your childhood that it's hard to separate things out. But the nature of my mom, this was, and again, I want to restate, the, the person who thought this was a good idea was Mrs. Schmally. <laughs> my mom actually thought the idea of the puppet show was kind of whack. So, but I think that it, it, I think Mark nailed it. I think. It, it, the outlet that it provided was such that they just went with it. And, and my mother, as your grandmother, um, was a person who ran with the ball. You know, if you said, as we all know, if you said there's going to be a costume party, you didn't really want to tell her because, <laughs> you know what I mean? You're like, it's a costume party. We're going to put, like, uh, you know, right, a right, mask right. on. Oh, no, no, let's build a gigantic machine that will bring to the party. Yeah. So, you know, so she was kind of like, yeah, just give me a, and I'll start, and then it, off it goes. So right. so I, we had sort of gotten used to that. Well, you kind of had really didn't have a choice early on. You know, there's there are many stories about uh, Conquer Park that have nothing to do with the uh, WPT, uh, and one of the best is, speaking about communal things, is Mark had mentioned it. Everybody, my mother was definitely afraid of, that we would all drown. I, don't, I know the reason why, and it doesn't matter. But the point was, so she decided we would all learn to swim. And then that became everybody in the neighborhood would learn to swim. So uh, St. Francis, Saint Francis yeah. which was a convent in Ben Salem, ben Salem maybe it was 20, 20 minutes away, yeah, 20, 20 minutes. Yeah. minutes. So, right, right. so what would happen is they would literally, every kid, would come to your house and get in your car. Every kid, there'd be, there'd be like 18 kids in a station wagon, right? <laughs> Luckily there were no seatbelt laws, and I'm not kidding about the number of kids in the station wagon, right? And off we would go. So we would drive to, the, to this convent where they had a big pool. She would open the door and everybody would go out and they'd take lessons. And then at the end, there'd be some kind of weird thing where everybody would just sort of recongregate by the car and they would go back to the thing. There was never any question about, well, is Tommy going or, or Dave Della? It just, people just showed up and got in the car, right? In fact, um, one of the favorite stories of Concord Park is the time that we were leaving and my mom was driving because they alternated who was responsible and she's counting heads and there's an extra head. <laughs> it's an extra kid. So she stops the car. It was a dirt road to the pool. She stops the car and she makes everybody get out. Because, you know, you got to check and see which kid it is. And she goes, you're not with me. And the kid goes, yeah, but I want to come back with you. She's like, no, that's not how it works. <laughs> no, you can't come back with us. She said to drive back to the pool and drop the kid off. We were so much fun, Jeff. <laughs> we attracted, we attracted the kid, all really, the other kids. The kid wanted to go, so she had to drop it off. So, so and, and there was at least once or twice, there were so many kids in the car that when you went, when you left 
St. Francis, you were on this dirt road and you went over this, this big hill. She would get to the hill, the car wouldn't go over the hill. So she would stop the car and then throw several kids out. You'll need to walk a quarter mile because we need to get over the hill right. and then you can get back in. Right. What? What? But yep. that's how it worked. So, so the, the community was, and no one's parents. Parents right. were like, yeah, where are you going? Right. Okay, we're going to the pool. There was no like arrangement or, or yeah. head check. It was yeah. like, okay, you just get in. Get in. Mr. Bodie. Remember, he used to, I don't know, you didn't go, but Mr. Bodie would drive, and he would, remember, he would always sing, he was always singing that song, the Crosby, Stills, Nash tune, the whole time, and if you put it on, he would start to dance in the car. <laughs> and this is what you grew up with. It was the Marrakesh Express. If you put that on, he would start, he would start dancing in the car, you're like, okay, all right. <laughs> it was yeah. a, it was the Red Cross swimming lessons, they were free, and you could, I was certified all the way up to, I think, right. advanced swimmer. That's right. And this is an incredibly valuable skill to learn mm -hmm. at a young age mm -hmm. for free. That's why my mom was just, take advantage of this. Everyone, let's go and get these, you know, I'm glad she did. Yeah. I yeah. learned all the basic swimming and mm -hmm. uh, the dead man's float and treading water and all of that stuff. As an adult, I still run across people who don't want to wade in past their mm -hmm. thighs. They can't swim. Yeah. They don't know rhythmic breathing. So that's one more thing. I'm like, thanks, Mom. Again, at the time, you're just like, oh, my mom's herding me into the car and we're going off here. But it was a very valuable thing to learn at such a young age. And I'm not sure. An addendum to um, what Jeff was speaking about, the uh, costume contest. I always remember that Aunt Alice would win every last one she <laughs> went to. For instance, there was a tennis shoe contest, and she decided to outdo everyone by going as a tennis shoe. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, and she I, did. I, I would like to share too. One year I was about 13, and she made me into a spider. Yes. Jay came to my house as a sandwich for one of the... Um, Which was my mom's a, costume. Yeah, it, yeah. he made it, she made a costume and he was a, he wasn't like, he was a sandwich, like as big as he was, was a sandwich. She so, was yeah. a telephone pole one year at Penswood Village yes. and a whole a bunch of costume people, there was a crowd going around and out of the corner of my eye I saw it and I knew that's what she was, she stood still for a long time, and all no of a sudden she moved. I screamed, <laughs> even though I knew that was my mom. See, and that's what she wanted. She wanted this effect of when I'm standing still, I am a telephone pole and you don't know that there's a person in right. here. So I, still yes. think, I still think without a doubt the best though was, was the Energizer Bunny. It, well, yeah. Because yeah. Uh, yeah. it was oh, embodied the, the person that was in the costume. Right, right. So. Just keeps going. <laughs> that's right. That's right. No one asked. No one asked who's in that costume, except for Marie Chapman, who was like, "Who is that?" And I'm like, "Really?" Anyway. The wonderful thing about Alice that whenever you were around her, you laughed. I mean, she would look at this microphone, Joyce. What do you think? What do you think about this microphone? What do you think, Joyce? And her? She was hysterical. I mean, no. If you were in a bad mood or had a bad day or something, just go to Alice Swan and that would correct that immediately because she was effervescent. No, no matter what her was happening in the background, Alice never showed it. She was effervescent at all times. That's why people right. loved her immensely. At her funeral, people came from out of the woodworks. I mean, they came from all over the place to honor Alice Swan because she was the most charitable, the most loving person. She really was. I, I referred to her as Aunt Alice because she used to walk me down to the school, my school stop in the morning when my parents went off to work. My mom and dad would drop me off at their home and then Alice would walk me down to my bus stop. So she knew me from, uh, yeah. from the jump. Yeah. I yeah. found a letter after she died and it, was, it just said, you know, how she felt about her life. And she said, when I die, do not be sad, have a party. And her memorial service was like a party. It was a, was a party. party. And yeah. that's exactly yeah. what she wanted. Right. So I still, I still have that letter. My mom also, we got into a thing when I was in Concord Park. I wanted to be a witch for Christmas. And you know, a witch has to wear all black. And my mom did not want me wearing all black and going out in the street, even though at that age, I wasn't allowed to cross the street Halloween night. I could go up and down the block and I was escorted by a parent. And Halloween night in Concord Park, there were not a lot of cars out. There was usually a car cruising around, kind of checking out, like the fathers would do that. They'd kind of cruise around and check out, and make sure things were okay. So we had this big argument, and then finally we settled on, she made me a gold cape, and she sewed black stars on the cape. 
and then I was allowed to be a witch with the black gown and the gold cape and the black. And the gold was the type of gold, it wasn't fluorescent, but it was the type of gold that when headlights hit it, it kind of illuminates it. So yes, that, but she was not going to let me trick or treat all black on Halloween night, even if I only stayed on one side of the road. She just was not going to. Well, I have a question. Um, in the exhibit, we have some Indian shadow puppets, which I believe the Shmalis brought back from their time as missionaries. And I was wondering, Marco, if they saw puppet shows in India and if maybe that planted a seed in your mother's mind. Um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, I do know that she had some of those puppets. Um, they did do some shadow work. Uh, it was not obviously one of their major productions, mm -hmm. um, but um, but yeah, the the India experience um, was I think a little overwhelming um, when they when they went as missionaries. Um, you know, it was after the war, but it was early fifties, um, and I think they were kind of like, oh, this, you know, you know, the, the church essentially had paid for my dad to go to medical school. And that's why they felt that he needed to go as a missionary for longer than the period of time that he went for. Um, but um, no, I don't, I don't, I think, I think my mom always had a creative, you know, kind of inquisitive, um, well, sure, let's try this, or let's, let's mm -hmm. try that. And I think that when put together with Alice, you know, that was like the dynamic duo, you know, because yeah. my mom would yeah. be like, well, what do you think of this, Alice? And Alice would be like, oh, that sounds like a great idea. Let's <laughs> yeah. do it, Let's do you it. know? It was. And I think that's, and I think that's where that initial push came from. But I'm not sure, I never, re we didn't have pictures of uh, things. I, I actually, um, for this, um, presentation and getting all the puppet stuff together. I, I looked at a bunch of slides from India um, and there were none uh, that were really puppet related, um, you know. But one thing that I, I did want to mention too, um, earlier uh, Jennifer had spoke about the Quaker connection. And I think that um, there was um, in, the, in some of the scripting, especially Punch and Judy, there was a uh, nonviolent scripting that occurred. And, um, you know, I mean, this was the 60s, and I don't know, there's a lot of violence now, um, but I think violence was kind of in the forefront then. You had the Vietnam War, um, you had, you know, the Cold War, and, and so war was, and then, you know, they stopped doing the Valiant Taylor because it had the word killing in it. You know, he was killing the flies, even though it was just flies. He was killing them, you know, the valiant, valiant, valiant Taylor. Um, and so, you know, I think later in life, my mom, um, when she was in New Hampshire, she went to prisons, um, not as a prisoner, um, but she went. <laughs> that to, we're aware of. She went to she went to prison. That was she used to say that um, she was she t um, did a program. There's a Quaker program called um, Alternatives to Violence, and she did that. She actually did it in schools also. Um, which I think she was kind of filling the void of puppetry because she didn't do as much puppetry on her own as, as Alice did. Um, but I think it's interesting that they, they actually thought about what they were putting out there mm -hmm. and how it might affect the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe these are children, uh, maybe these are adults, um, but they were really conscious and conscientious about what they put out there. Um, and I think that, um, you know, my mom, I, I feel really embraced um, the Quaker values um, as even as, you know, she got older. Um, and I think the nonviolent part of that um, is what really, I don't know if it made the shows special um, or just different, um, but it certainly, I think, made them. Um, better, made a better message um, to convey to the audience, so. 
Thank you. I would agree. Yeah. I would agree completely. Mm -hmm. I do want to say one thing that I did learn in putting down the putting shit together. What Mark said is 100% true. 90% of what I can evaluate of the ideas came from Nancy, and then she would hand them to my mother, who would then be like a dog with a bone and drive <laughs> the thing home. So the weighted tail in the in the wolf, the pop-up hat on the on the uh, ostrich, ostrich, the um, I believe the dry ice. Um, in one of the videos, they go through, and and your mother apparently would come in and say, "Hey, here's an idea," and then my mom would say, oh, "Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's make that happen." <laughs> so so I think they did make a. They were obviously a compliment to each other. They brought different skills and approaches to the process. I and, think they learned from each other because. Yeah. Mark's mom passed away. My mom was still doing shows, I believe. Yeah. yeah. So it was like the beginning and the end. Yeah. Your mom started it. My mom ended it. Yeah. And and the Mr. Punch thing is correct. If the traditional Mr. Punch is a lot of slapping and smacking, and he blows up and he gets hit, and the dogs and that. And mom made sure the last shows she did were Punch and Judy, and there was no. Nobody was hit in those shows. No one at all. I mean, there was there was a conflict between the the Punch and Judy, but it did not involve any violence at all. And so that that speaks to the fact that she was not about violence. She was yeah. very very. So she wanted to do Punch and Judy, but she had to really revamp it in order to make it something she could do. Well, and she made Judy a much stronger character yes. Yes. too. Yes. You know, and I think um, when you look at Nancy and Alice, I mean. They were pretty strong individuals. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. And so I think they wanted to put that out there mm -hmm. that, you know, Judy could be a strong individual, could be a strong woman, mm -hmm. you know, could um, do great things. Right. right. You know, which, which in the 60s, right. you know, I mean, right. now Me Too and other things, you know, in the 60s, that was pretty revolutionary yeah. mm -hmm. to, to have those, those thoughts. And that's where I think... A lot of that comes back, I mean, I don't want to push the Quaker aspect, but, you know, the Quakers, I, I feel, were, were ahead of their time yes. when it came to um, a lot of just equality, period, just no. equality. No question. So. No question. Excellent. Any more questions from the floor? Okay. Yes. 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 Uh, uh, she still lives in the original in house, the and her neighbors on either side are original homesteaders. Yeah. No? Only, only one side. One side. Oh. Ernette Reed is still an original homesteader. Right. And Chris Thomas is another one. She's around the corner, about three oh. houses okay. away. Uh, Mrs. Takashima is another original homesteader. And I think that's, that's the original one. So there's yeah. only three families. Right. Yeah, we, their children, there's some of their children there. Descendants of the original homeowners. We've had reporters come out and want to go back to Joyce's house and talk to Ernette Reed standing in her backyard, just wanting to get the feel of here we are where it started, talking to people who were a part of it. That what had happened was <laughs> the um, as people as people's families grew, the houses were too small. Each house only had one bathroom, five kids, two parents. One bathroom, oh, hell no. So they had to, that's why we moved out. We didn't move out because we didn't want to be there. We moved out because it was just untenable. And as, as people moved out to larger places, because Milgram was no longer involved, people who moved in were minority people of color. And so it became largely, a, um, it wasn't as integrated as it was before. Right. And of course, whites didn't move in because they had other choices where they could go. And so it, it's not the same integrated neighborhood that it used to be, but it's still there. Yeah. The, Although uh, now it is changing. Yeah, it is changing say, now. You know, right. Morris Milgram will be very happy because uh, most of the homes that are for sale now are going to either whites or, Nate, or um, Asian people. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's doing a, a turnaround, it's so it's just wonderful, go. just it's, wonderful. It, it should be stated that part of the force of the change was driven by the, actually a, a positive thing. The uh, Mars Rule had essentially in, embodied, for obviously ethical reasons, uh, a quota. Mm -hmm. Well, the quota was deemed illegal. Right. You, right. Can, you can't have a quota system. So 
whether you have a quota for good or for bad, the point is the quota was deemed illegal. So the minute the quota was deemed illegal, and again, going back, you have to put it in context, you have a house, houses, nice houses in a nice neighborhood outside of Philadelphia where if you were a black person, you could actually move. So as people moved out, it was probably a waiting list of families going, okay, this is my, uh, my opportunity. It, it wasn't uh, as we found. Uh, you could move to other neighborhoods, but there were, it wasn't without cost. And, and the whites in Concord Park obviously weren't prejudiced, so they didn't mind selling their house to a right. black family. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. Concord Park is now considered part of Lynn Park, Lincolnia and Concord Park. And my understanding is Lincolnia has become integrated too. Yeah. So that yeah, so that's that's kind of a nice thing yeah. that has happened. I but wanted to share one more thing about off the topic about punching Judy Night before Christmas. There's no violence in that show. Yeah, that's the no. show. None. Mm -hmm. But you have to wait till Christmas. But to get back to Milgram, I think he we we had a 50th reunion, and he really he was very sad. He he thought that it was a failure because the integrated nature did not maintain. And we told him it wasn't, but he 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 was not very happy. We right. feel that our legacy really embodies the spirit of Concord Park. So we've continued to live our lives with those values. One of the other things that happened. When we were there and left, my father had already converted the garage. The zoning laws at the time did not allow for additions. When you drive through Concord Park now, they've become second story homes, some of them, and they've become, because they're allowed to do that. We couldn't do that. So that's another one of the reasons that, uh, that we left. I want to mention that I had the wonderful opportunity to work for Morris Milgram one summer when I was attending Temple University. At this point, he had an office on Roosevelt Boulevard, and the name of his organization at that time was Fund for an Open Society. And I was just so happy to work for him just on the weekends, doing some filing in the office and so forth. And he would just talk all about the experiences that he had. And by the way, he's written a book, it's called Good Neighborhood by Morris Milgram. You can find it online. There aren't many copies left, but it is online. I have the autographed copy. Wow of Morris Milgram along with some notes. He would always write notes to me. As a matter of fact, one time um, he had to go, he had to leave the office early and go to New York for something. He says, get on the train with me and, and get off get off at the, your stop and some, have somebody pick you up and I'll tell you more stories. So I got on the train with him going, you know, I think I got off in Trenton or something like that and had somebody come pick me up at the tra Trenton train station because he was telling me all the stories about his life. And to your point, he had some disappointments that Concord Park did not remain the same, 55% white, 45% African-American, because that's the only way that he could entice whites to move into Concord Park. However, his second project, which was called Greenbelt Knoll, which was in Northeast Philadelphia near Nazareth Hospital, that remained, and I don't know how it is today, but that remained integrated for a long period of time. But I, I'm not, I haven't talked to anyone down there lately. I know one of his daughters had moved in there. Oh, um, really? yeah. yeah, interesting yeah, connection okay. to Greenbelt well, Knoll. Reverend Leon Sullivan, who was a pioneering African American with um, inner city urbanization and you know revitalization. My dad worked for him as an architect, designed Progress Plaza, the first black owned shopping center in Philadelphia. And Leon Sullivan lived in Greenbelt Knoll. So it's amazing how some of these things um, all connect. Milgram also went on to plant many other residential areas, apartments, townhomes, and other places. And myself and some others, I got a Concord Park Wikipedia entry going. We're trying to get an entry for Morris Milgram. One of the things my dad pointed out when Warren Schwarzbeck died, Karen said, her father told her, do not write an obituary and do not have a ceremony. He, he did not want that. You cannot find anything about his death online. And I said to my dad, why? And he said, they were very humble men. They were not in it for the fame. They were in it because they believed it was the right thing to do. Yeah. So that to me was just it's fascinating. Cool. Warren Schwartzbeck was like Morris Milgram's right-hand man, and they were the last original homesteader white family in Concord Park, and they actually endured some unpleasant times because some of the blacks who moved in later didn't know the history, and they, you know, they just 
were confident in who they were and why they were there. But you can find an article online about the last original white family leaving Concord Park. They both passed away. They moved into a retirement community and what that was like. Okay, we are at 12.01. Oh. Uh, deepest thanks to the panelists uh, for taking the time to have this conversation with us. Thanks to HowlRound for hosting the live stream. And thanks to the Puppeteers of America for um, giving us this time and space. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.